Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining us today at our virtual worship service. Whether you're a member of our Unitarian Universalist Fellowship on the Emerald Coast, or a newcomer wishing to learn more about our liberal church, we're glad that you chose to be with us today. I'm Charlene Farley, and I'm a chair of our religious services at the fellowship. We are a liberal theological church, and this month we're exploring the meaning of religious faith. Last week, we asked you to think about what faith means to you. And this week, our guest minister, the Reverend Sian Wiltshire, senior minister at the Orange Coast Unitarian Universalist Church, addresses another perspective on faith. In her message entitled, A Test of Faith, I think that you'll agree with me after hearing her that she raises more questions for us to think about during the week. Your comments are always welcomed and we hope that you will subscribe to our weekly e-newsletter as well as visit our uufec.com website for announcements of events occurring at our fellowship. Your financial support is always appreciated. Thank you for joining us today. And now we'll continue with our call for worship. A Community of Faith by Judith Quarries. At this hour in small towns and big cities in single rooms and ornate sanctuaries, many of our sibling Unitarian Universalist congregations are also lighting a flaming chalice. As we light our chalice today, let us remember that we are a part of a great community of faith. May this dancing flame inspire us to fill our lives with the Unitarian Universalist ideals of love, justice, and truth. Hi, it's time for another story. And today I have two stories for you. They're both very short. One of them is a Chinese story, and one is um, about the Mullah Nasruddin, who I talked about a couple months ago, and I told you he'd be coming back. And that's from the Islamic tradition. And they're both about the same thing. They're both about losing something and looking for it. So the first story uh, is Chinese. And in this story, a man from the kingdom of Chu needed to cross a river. And he got on a ferry boat, a small boat, to ferry him across the river. And with him, he had his beautiful sword that was priceless and absolutely gorgeous. And the other people on the ferry wanted to see his sword. So he took it out and he was showing it to them. And when the boat got to the middle of the river, the water got very rough and the, he dropped the sword over the side of the boat. And the people said, oh, are you ever gonna be able to find your sword again? You know, look and see, you would landmarks on the side and you'll know where to look for it. And he said, don't worry. And he took his knife and he made a mark on the side of the boat. And he said, this is where my sword fell in. If I look under that mark on the boat, I'll always be able to find my sword. Okay, think about this. When the boat reached the shore, the man jumped out of the boat and went right below the mark that he made on it and looked and looked and looked, but he couldn't find his sword. And he said to himself, I marked it. Isn't this the place where my sword fell in? But he never could find it. 
So the second story is about Mullah Nasruddin. And if you remember, I told you he's sort of the jokester Mullah telling stories and they're funny stories, but they always have a lesson in them. And he's, some people say he's from, he was originally from Turkey. Um, this picture is in Uzbekistan, but he's, he's, these are from mostly the Islamic tradition. So, so in this story, the Mullah Nasruddin, um, a man is walking home last night and he sees the Mullah Nasruddin down on all fours, crawling around on his hands and knees, looking frantically under a street light on the road, looking for something on the ground. And the man says, Mullah, what have you lost? And Nasruddin says, I'm searching for my key. I've dropped it and I cannot find it. And the man says, oh, I'll help you look and joins the Mullah Nasruddin. And soon they're both down on their hands and knees and they're digging around and looking for this key. And after a while, the man says, tell me, Mullah, do you remember exactly where you dropped the key? And Nasruddin points back into the darkness and says, over there in my house, I lost the key inside my house. And the passerby jumps up and says, why are you looking out here in the street? And the Mullah Nasruddin says, well, there's a lot more light out here than there is in my house. So Mullah Nasruddin was looking in that place because there was more light. So both of these stories are about looking for something, but looking in the wrong place. And the Chinese man, he was looking for his sword and Amola Nasruddin was looking for his key. But you could be looking for a lot of things. You could be looking for new friends. You could be looking for faith and God. You could be looking for joy. You could be looking for wealth. And maybe you could be looking in the wrong place. So next time you think about that you're looking for joy and, and you go back and you look in all the same places you used to look in, maybe you should think about where the joy really is and look in a new place or look for your key in a dark place because that's where it is. So I hope you enjoyed these stories and think about where you look for things inside yourself and maybe try something new. And I'll see you again with another story soon. So for those of you who might be new to Unitarian Universalism, every year in uh, late June, Unitarian Universalists from around the world, around the country, gather for what is known as General Assembly. Has anybody here, who here has been to General Assembly? A number of people here have been to General Assembly before. Anybody go this year? Yeah, me neither. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this year it was in Spokane, Washington. My home state, but not my hometown. And there was a very interesting sort of controversy that happened when they were there. And I thought I would let you know just a little bit about what happened there. I don't know if anybody has been following this online. The Spokane minister, who was the hosting minister for General Assembly, he wrote a book that got a number of people into a bit of a tizzy. He gave it out free at General Assembly. He didn't tell his congregation he was doing this either. It's basically uh, three essays that he wrote about his feeling around Unitarian Universalism. And it's from the point of view of a very white, cisgendered, hetero, able-bodied male. <laughs> he spoke of his disillusionment with our denomination and it's anti-oppression, anti-racism work. And the emotions of hurt and anger on behalf of those who have been marginalized made him uncomfortable. And he proposed that instead that we focused on rationalism 
and that uh, we perhaps disband the Unitarians and the Universalists because he felt that the merger was part of the cause of all this problem, which I was sort of like, mm, okay, I'm not sure. I'm a Unitarian Universalist, I'm neither Unitarian nor Universalist. But at any rate, um, I don't really want to <coughs> go that much into it. I wasn't there, but I've been following and I read actually some big chunks of what he wrote and I'm kind of going, oh honey. <laughs> <laughs> but I realize it's a story, it, you know, his, his feelings is about someone who's losing his faith, right? He's disillusioned and he's lashing out. He wants to go back to the good old days. That that was for him. What were the good old days? Maybe for a lot of other people it wasn't so good. But I realized that his the sense of his losing his faith is something that I've been struggling with this too. Not, not so much my faith in Unitarian Universalism, although you know I've had some struggling with some of the ways that we've been handling our anti-racism work but I think it's really good work. I think it's work that we need to do, um, and we can do it better. But my faith I've been struggling with is, is faith in humanity. With all of the mass shootings, environmental disasters, political oppression, racism, I don't know about you, but there are times I just wanna go be a hermit in the woods. I don't wanna look at Google News, and it starts piling up. And I'm someone, I'm a humanist. I believe in the human spirit. That's part of my core sentiments of who I am. And so this has been hammering down on me, I feel like, just day after day. But you know, faith is a tricky word for Unitarian Universalists. As Salzburg points out, it can have connotations of dogma, of unquestioning loyalty to a person, religion, or an organization. But like Salzburg desire to reclaim that word, I think we need it. I, I do think we need this word faith, especially in this period of history where it feels like our institutions, whether they're political or they're religious or familial or environmental, they feel like they're falling apart. And I think there's something that we can learn from Salzburg's version of faith. And faith, I want to point out, is not the same as belief. As Salzburg put it, she says, faith is not a definition of reality, not a received answer but an active, open state that makes us willing to explore. While beliefs come to us from the outside, faith comes from within, from our alive participation in the process of discovery. And faith, she tells us, is, is about connection. Whether it's connection to a person, a religion, an organization, a country, a humanity. It's all about relationship. Now Salzburg says that there are sort of three kinds of faith and she sees them as stages. And I, I do too to some extent. So the first one she talks about is bright faith. Bright faith is similar, but it's different to blind faith, right? Both tend to be inspired by something outside ourselves, but blind faith is an unthinking devotion to a person, idea, or place that sees it as a fulfillment rather than a beginning. Bright faith is just a beginning, right? It's kind of like, you know when you fall in love, right? Oh, they're just so perfect. <laughs> I love them for like soulmates. You know, that feeling of connection that you get and everything looks so wonderful. That's when I encountered shamanism. That was for me, it was like, I had, I had not expected to like it at all. And I did. Same place, like I went, just went to Scotland. I've been wanting to go to Scotland. There's something about that place that feels right to me. I don't know why, it just does. And it's also about how I thought about Unitarian Universalism when I first heard about it and I found my first church. I was so excited. I was like, it fits, it felt like a glove, like it just fit on me. But bright faith, in a sense, it can't last. It's a beginning. It's meant to be sort of a flash to tell you something, to help you say, hey, maybe this is something that I need. It's the beginning, not the fulfillment. And I think that the Spokane minister is trying to stay in a bright faith. We want it to be perfect, right? We don't want to know in that relationship, you know, we don't want to hear the bad stuff, the third date stuff, right? We don't, <coughs> don't want to know that. We want to keep our rose-tinted glasses that we put on, and sometimes hearing that pain can take them off. But organizations, religions, countries were made up of people, right? Imperfect, beautiful people. 
We miss out if we keep trying to see people through these lenses. If we do, we're gonna implode like the Spokane minister. He wants our faith to be perfect, his version of what perfect is. And I think he needs to move on to that second stage of faith. And that second stage of faith is a verified faith. But it kind of has a middle step. Now, and I, I put this up here because she, she talks a lot actually in her book about going through it. And it's a doubting faith. Before you can verify that this is right for me, whether it's a relationship or religion or organization, you have to go through a period of questioning. And I think often this step is forced upon us, like when we're let down by someone. Someone disappoints us. We wonder where should I even be in relationship with them, with that organization or that country. And I think that's what happened to the Spokane minister. He doesn't like how the anti-oppression work is going. He's uncomfortable. And I think it's okay to doubt and to question. But unfortunately, he jumps straight into conclusions and solutions without actually having a dialogue. His book is a monologue, not a dialogue. And sometimes fear or cynicism, they shut down any questions that we might ask. For example, it's said that when the Buddha first became enlightened, he was walking down a road and a man saw him coming and noticed just something about this man was just amazing. And so he said, who are you? And the Buddha replied, I am an awakened one. And the man just looked at him and said, yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, man, the man missed out, right? He could have been curious. What does that mean? Help me understand that. I see you blowing. I don't understand. <laughs> Cynicism is not the way to verifying faith. Questioning, curiosity is. To get beyond bright faith, to ask a, ver to a verified faith, we need to ask questions. To see, as the Buddha said, for ourselves what is true or not true. I want to tell you a story that one time I was almost recruited into a cult. It was kind of funny. It's kind of fun, a funny story. I was living in Boston at the time. I was in my uh, early 30s, I think. And I, I just moved to Boston. I didn't know that many people. I was walking home one day. And a woman stopped me as I was walking by her, and she complimented me on my scarf. Now, she seemed very normal and nice, and without realizing, suddenly I, I realized after about five minutes we were talking about the definition of joy, like our, our conversation had gotten really deep really quickly. And she said, you know, I'm really enjoying talking with you. Would you like to, to meet for coffee? I'm like, I mean, part of my gut is going, this is not normal. I mean, you have to meet people, right? Like, this is... Culturally, not quite right, but I thought, you know, why not? She seems nice enough, you know? I didn't know many people. So our first meeting, she let me do most of the talking. She kept asking me questions. And at one point, I remember, she asked me how much money I made. <laughs> Warning bells <laughs> start going off, right? And I'm kind of like, look, you know it again. You know, your, your, your rational mind starts going, oh, well, you know, maybe she's just curious, you know? We're all curious sometimes about what people make. Yeah, whatever, you know? But... Ding, 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 you're still going on there. So she says, you know what, I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine. And she said, I'll, you know, I'd like to you know, set you guys, I think you'd really like her, you know, we'll go have lunch. Again, I thought this sort of seemed a lot. I hadn't known her that well. She wants me to meet this friend. Again, not culturally just normal, but okay. Nothing threatening or anything like that. So she arranged us for me for lunch near my work. And she said, and at the end, this friend of hers, who again seemed pretty nice, she says, I want to tell you something, but I have to have your assurance that you won't tell anyone else. That did it. Like, that was it. I was like, I'm sorry, I don't feel comfortable giving you those assurances. I don't know what you're going to say to me. And she said, oh, nothing terrible or anything. But she said, some people don't understand. And I said, you know, I'm a pretty understanding person, but I don't believe in secrecy. <clears throat> and this just doesn't feel right to me. And I remember she said, oh, well, you're, you're just not ready. <laughs> but bye. <laughs> and that was the last I ever heard from them. Questions and trusting your gut are a part of doubting. Is there something that isn't right here? Does this person, this tradition, this organization doesn't share my values? Right? If someone isn't open about who they are or the organization won't answer your questions, red flags should be going up. 
I remember my, my twin sister, bless her heart, she actually dated a pathological liar, and finally the bells went off, right? I mean, we, people are out there that do these things. Now, it's not easy. It's not easy to question a doubt, to trust your gut. Sometimes we normalize even a single bad event. We say, oh, this happened, so therefore, everyone in that organization must be bad, or all men, or all women, or whatever it is, are all bad. So like, for example, if a loved one forgets to call you once, do you assume that that means that they no longer love you, right? If an organization you normally like has one bad customer service rep, do you just never shop there again? How do you verify if the relationship you're in is a good one? These are good questions, and you know, it's interesting. I, you know, I just got back from vacation, uh, and we had gotten a message sent through our Facebook page. We'd had a visitor who'd come to the congregation, and one of our guest speakers was speaking about paganism and shamanism when I wasn't here. Wonderful thing, you know, I'm a shaman too. The visitor overheard someone refer to it as schmuckism. <laughs> and this visitor wrote to us on Facebook, and they said in their message, it is extremely upsetting to know that this type of behavior is taking place within a church that claims to preach tolerance, acceptance, and inclusiveness. <coughs> he went on to say he wouldn't recommend our church to others and probably wouldn't be back. Mm. Now I find it interesting because here he was attending a worship service filled with people talking about shamanism and paganism. Everyone there accepting that this was the case and he normalized our church by the behavior of two people. But this happens, right? I've heard of this in other churches that I have served. I've heard in other union churches. People come here with pain too in their hearts about other religions or the way that they see things. We don't ask that everyone believe everything that's set up here, but we do ask people to be respectful, right? And people come with such vulnerabilities and fears to a church. Will they be judged? Is who they are really welcome here? And you know, this visitor, they had a right to be upset. We don't ask, as I said, is for people to believe everything, we just ask people to be respectful. <clears throat> but the thing is, I know something that this visitor doesn't know. I have deep faith in this congregation. Not because it's perfect. It certainly isn't. We fall down quite a bit. We, I, don't always live up to my own ideals, to our own ideals. But I also know that it can be incredibly loving, incredibly supportive, open, and inclusive. And I've verified this. I verify my faith in all of you. I see it in the way that people take care of one another, from the ministries we've done, from our caring ministry, to the Environmental Film Festival, the AIDS team ministry that was here for years. I see it for people showing up for one another over and over and over again been verified to me. And in fact, if you weren't aware, we have one of the most diverse congregations in our denomination, interestingly enough, in all of the forms of diversity that there are. And that verifies something to me. But sometimes we fall flat on our faces. And we have to recommit ourselves to providing that inclusive, safe space for everyone, for being respectful. And that's how it gets verified for me, not by doing it perfectly, but by learning from our mistakes. I'm in it for the long haul, not just one Sunday. You know, there's a, a famous relationship guru by, the, guru by the name of John uh, Gottman. You may hear, have you heard of John Gottman? Yeah, he, if you, again, if you haven't heard of this guy, he's awesome. He's all about relationships between people, and mostly around romantic married uh, or long-term relationships. What he talks about is that in order for a relationship to be strong, you need five positive experiences to every one bad experience. For me in this church, there are five, there's a five to one ratio. I mean, sometimes, yeah, we fall down, but most of the time, we stand up. But I do hope that whoever said those words did that disrespect, that they hear how hurtful and damaging that it can be to say things like that. You know, the number one reason people 
leave a church or any relationship is because there's a perceived lack of integrity in there. It's when we don't live up to our values. For example, even in this country, right, we say, give us your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, <laughs> but we separate families and vilify the undocumented. We believe in life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, but only if you look and love like me. And so people get cynical when they see this lack of integrity. And the citizenism, cynicism toward our country and our religious institutions has, I think, only gotten worse with you know, tales of sexual abuse you know, in churches and in politics. There's the abuse of the LGBTQ people while saying in the same breath, but God's love. God, if God is love, God loves all. People are afraid to trust, and can you blame them? And when the media keeps throwing bad examples at us, we can lose faith and relationship in our country, our institutions. So how do we move beyond the hurt that will inevitably occur in any relationship? How do we not lose our faith in humanity, in our country, in our religion, in our relationships? And I ask this because I've been feeling that way, right, about my country. I'm losing faith, I want it back. So here's what I've been practicing, what I've been trying to do. So first of all, I try to get some perspective, right? Seeing beyond the moment and seeing the larger view. Is just, this just a moment in time, a phase that we're going through? We've got a, another year or so <laughs> before elections. I'm just saying, um, <laughs> but we, you know, we, we do have to we have to think about this as a perspective. We've been moving forward as best we can. We've been incredible advances that have been going on. We can't lose sight of those advances too, because other people didn't give up. Which leads me to the second: we just keep doing what we're doing. T.S. Eliot said, for us, there's only the trying. The rest is not our business. All I know that what I can do is here in my little, my little queendom of my church is that I can keep preaching love. That's all I can do. Well, it's not all, but it's a lot of what I can do. And that has to be enough, right? Like we will do, each one of us, if each one of us does our part, that's what we do. And we don't know what impact this is going to have down the road. We, we don't know. And the third is to look for the love. So where is the love? I love, you know, of course, you know, the famous look for the helpers, right? In any disaster, where are the helpers? I don't know if you've noticed this in the news, but I'm noticing that there are less stories about the perpetrators of violence and more stories about the heroes in those moments. And that does help me. You know, I, I, uh, I'm a, someone who follows Reddit online, and Reddit is this place where people post all sorts of things, and there's this one subreddit that is called Before and After Pictures of Adoption, and it shows pictures of before and after of pets being adopted, dogs and cats. And I look at the before picture, and I think, man, how could humanity ever do that? And I look at the after picture, like, oh, humanity is so wonderful. Look at what we love. <laughs> <laughs> and it's important, right, for us to, to see both, to see that, yes, there are horrible things in this world, and there are also beautiful people in this world. And I personally think they outnumber the bad five to one. And the choir says, I believe in love, I believe in love, even when, even when I don't feel it. That's the other thing, feel love even when you don't feel it. You know, we talk about thoughts and prayers and it's one of those things that I know that it can be so hypocritical because we hear it so much from political people who have all this power to actually make change but all they do is thoughts and prayers, right? As a minister, I'm very aware of this. But my way of saying prayer, if I ever put this in an email to you that I'm holding you in my heart, or holding you and your family in my heart, know that literally I have stopped. I have literally envisioned you with compassion and love in my heart 
and praying that that comes for you in your time of difficulty. And I know that sounds hokey, and I don't know that it actually helps in any way, except for that I know that it helps me. Mm -hmm. It connects me with you. Mm -hmm. It connects me with my humanity, and it <clears throat> inspires me. And so I've been trying so hard to hold this country in love. That's really hard at times. <laughs> But it helps me and inspires me to want to get out there and make a difference. A verified faith, it goes beyond bright faith. It means you spend some time figuring out yourself <laughs> doubting and questioning. Is this worth having faith in? A verified faith, it doesn't happen overnight. It needs to be tested constantly, not just once. In relationships of any kind, it's building enough positive moments, those bright moments that we need to outweigh the bad, right? The five positive for every one bad. Salzburg then, she goes on to talk about an abiding faith. That's her, what she calls her third stage of faith. And she's talking mostly really about religion. Abiding faith, she says, is less about having faith in others, but it's about having faith in ourselves. And I don't think of this necessarily as a third stage but it's one that we build up over a lifetime. It's about learning to trust yourself, your integrity, your own authenticity. It's having an alignment with who we are with our highest values. It's when we make meaning of our faith and our lives. <clears throat> it's trusting that this life, our, our God, our ultimate concern, whatever you want to call it, is we trust that because we verified it for ourselves. I mean, think about all of the work that's done in the civil rights movement, right? They had faith in justice, that justice was right. They knew it in their bones that it was right. And they kept their faith, because if they lost it, we wouldn't have had a civil rights movement. They kept their faith in that, and it kept moving them forward despite all of the setbacks. And the more you know yourself, the more you know what that rightness is, that alignment for you is, the more you learn to have faith in yourself. For me, it's about having faith in love and faith in community. That I have verified over and over again. I've seen its power. Because, you know, the one relationship that you can't get away from, you can't just write a book about, believe in a huff, send a Facebook message to, it's yourself, right? Often what we're looking for in another person or a religion or an organization is what we want in ourselves. It's like that woodcutter in today's story. What we find, we find within ourselves, then we recognize it in others. That's when beauty becomes released. And that is when we have abiding faith. I believe in Unitarian Universalism, not because it's perfect, but because it allows me to question, to doubt, to verify for myself that it works. Like I said, for me, that's love and community. Love is that flame that burns within. It's what I choose to have faith in, and I've verified it. I've seen it in this church, in my life, and the wider world. I get so heartbroken about our country I can lose my faith in this country, in our humanity. But when I think about this church, I renew my faith because I've verified it. I've seen it heal people. I've seen it make a difference in lives. I've seen people grow and change through its power, and that abides in me, and it abides in you. So as we sang, when hope awaits at every turn, I know we will go on. Let us sing. <clears throat>
and across the earth. Power. 